So today we're going to be discussing a planet we normally don't talk much about, Mercury. And mostly because of some of the recent discoveries coming from Mercury that the scientists were able to make in just the last few months. But before we start the video, I actually wanted to start with the picture. Because in this case, you're not actually looking at Mercury, you're looking at the Moon. Here is what the picture of Mercury looks like, and the reason I wanted to do this is basically because there is an unusual similarity between these two objects. The Moon and Mercury, in terms of the actual surface properties, are generally quite similar. And so in this video we're going to be discussing some of these studies that actually use these similarities to learn new things about Mercury as well. Anyway, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's finally discuss new discoveries and new revelations about Mercury, mostly done by the recent passage of the Beppe Colombo mission, the Japanese-European collaboration that has recently done a major flyby in a process taking some of the most detailed pictures from the surface of Mercury as the mission flew by at just 236 kilometers away from the surface of Mercury. But that's of course just the beginning because the main purpose of the mission is to eventually assume an orbit around Mercury, starting its official scientific mission, but even before that it was able to take some really impressive pictures which in the process allowed the scientists to basically start naming new craters detected on the surface. One of them right there is named Manly, after the famous YouTuber Scott Manley. Oh wait, sorry, no, actually after someone I've never heard of before, Edna Manley, a Jamaican artist often considered to be the mother of Jamaican art. Yeah, I didn't know that. Anyway, the point is that there are a lot more features with different names now that have now been officially approved by the Astronomical Union. But a lot of other geological features became visible as well. For example, a lot of different basin floors, flooded by various types of lava, clearly demonstrating history of volcanic activity on the surface of this planet. In the future, one of the studies is going to be measuring levels of carbon in these areas, which are usually visible because they don't reflect as much light, in order to discover what sort of minerals are hiding here and to learn more about geological history, in order to then compare it to the Moon. Which is actually how a lot of these studies are going to be conducted. Because of the geological similarities of Mercury to the Moon, many of the studies often focus on examining the surface of these two objects and then trying to see what's actually different. For example, in one of the recent studies, by using approximately 3000 images obtained by the NASA's Messenger probe, scientists were able to discover the amount of various boulders present on the surface of both objects. Although because the Mercury's pictures are much lower in resolution, in order to make the study less biased, the scientists essentially lowered the resolution for the Moon pictures as well. In order to essentially compare the total number of various large rocks, boulders, on the surfaces of both objects. And well, turns out that the surface of Mercury contains way way less boulders than the Moon, on average approximately 30 times less. Naturally suggesting that different types of processes happen on both objects despite a lot of similarities. And there are three potential explanations to why this is so. For example, because Mercury is much closer to the Sun, and because the Moon is also directly connected to planet Earth, both objects probably receive a much different amount of micrometeorites hitting the surface. On the surface of the Moon, when they actually hit the surface, it's very likely at least 15 times slower, with some of them also potentially going to Earth instead of the Moon. But on Mercury, because of the proximity to the Sun, the velocity is much higher, and so the micrometeorites are able to destroy and grind these boulders over time much much easier. On the other hand, the regolith itself seems to be much thicker on Mercury compared to the Moon. And that means that even when the collision happens, in order to produce various boulders, it does not result in as many rocks as what we usually get from a typical crater on the Moon. Lastly, the temperature fluctuations on the Moon are much lower than Mercury. And the amount of thermal stress experienced on the surface of Mercury potential results in the additional abrasion and destruction of various boulders. The Moon experiences approximately three times less thermal stress compared to Mercury. And as a result of this, a typical rock can easily last at least 100 million years on the Moon. On Mercury, it shrinks to just a few million years in comparison. But all of this thermal stress on Mercury causes a lot of other features as well that we actually have not seen anywhere else in the solar system. For example, one of the images from Bappy Colombo shows us a strange feature known as Bigo Rupes, one of many very long scratch-like or stretch mark formations formed as a result of the planet cooling down and contracting over time. This one is about 600 kilometers in length 
and actually cuts through the newly named crater that you see right there. Something that's visible in a lot of different formations on the surface of Mercury. And this is actually a result of the planet cooling down and contracting, which then forms a variety of very unusual features, but sometimes they seem to be much younger than the craters. Or basically they'll be visible on top of the crater instead of being underneath. And that implies that these unusual scratch marks must have appeared afterwards. They seem to be much younger. And so these formations, known as lobate scarps, features only existing on Mercury, have now been detected in a lot of different locations, many of them potentially as young as just several hundred million years old. Which actually suggests one thing. Not only did Mercury already shrink by about 7 kilometers in radius over the last 4.5 billion years, these formations suggest that it's actually still shrinking and still becoming smaller. And we see this through the increase of these scratch-like or scratch mark formations visible pretty much everywhere on the surface of Mercury. And what's even more surprising is that most of these unusual formations seem to be much younger at under 300 million years old. In terms of size, they're usually about 1 kilometer wide and anywhere from 10 to 150 meters deep, but tens or even hundreds kilometers in length. And so the implication that the Mercury is still shrinking is definitely there. But why is it shrinking is another question. And some of the potential answers to this might come from a study of something entirely different. The amount of various volatiles visible on the surface of Mercury. Now technically this planet should not have any ices or any volatiles on its surface. They should be already vaporized by the sun. But in reality, it's extremely rich in volatiles, visible as these white and blue formations on the surface, very likely representing things like water, carbon monoxide, sodium, and so on. And as many of them break through the surface, they form something that we don't see anywhere else in the solar system. Very strange collapsed pits, unusual mountains, or sometimes unusual vents similar to volcanoes that seem to be a result of vapor coming from underneath the surface. But unlike a typical volcano, they'll often be surrounded by remnants of various ices, visible as bright materials around the formation. And technically they should not be here. They should have been eroded a long time ago and evaporated in the process. Yet many of these formations do exist in a lot of locations on Mercury, but predominantly in much darker areas, specifically correlated with what the scientists refer to as low reflectance material. And though it's not entirely clear what these are, they're most likely a result of sublimation that causes a lot of the surface to sink or potentially suddenly release a lot of gas similar to a typical volcano but not as explosive as Volcano, maybe somewhat similar to what happens on Ceres. We know that Ceres, for example, seems to have signs of somewhat similar formations. And that of course implies two things. One is that Mercury is clearly relatively rich in volatiles, so things like, for example, ices like water and carbon monoxide, and was thus maybe created much farther away from the Sun, but was eventually transported to its current orbit through some kind of a gravitational interaction. It's unclear what it was, but it could have been Jupiter. And as a result of its orbital change, all of the volatiles underneath start to eventually sublimate, producing these unusual features and these unusual cracks, and potentially causing the planet to shrink over time. And interestingly, a lot of these compounds escaping from underneath are directly visible as unusual tails around Mercury. The most famous one is the sodium tail you see right here, which makes it appear as a type of a comet. But there are other compounds inside Mercury's exosphere, or very thin atmosphere, that also escape from the surface, creating additional tails. For example, there's another one that seems to be more violet or purple, produced entirely by calcium. But interestingly, by studying the exosphere, it might become possible to understand exactly what's happening underneath Mercury, and what's causing it to shrink, and what's coming from underneath. Right now, the analysis suggests that the exosphere is approximately 40% oxygen, 30% sodium, 20% hydrogen, and 6% helium, with a little bit of potassium, argon, neon, carbon dioxide, water, nitrogen, and xenon present in there as well. And so by studying the exosphere, which is very likely produced by the emissions from underneath, it will become possible to understand what's happening here. Right now these are just preliminary observations, but we might learn more in September of 2024, when the Bepi Colombo mission comes for another round. It's actually going to be doing several more flybys and eventually will establish a permanent orbit for a two-year mission. And so by 2028, we should know a lot more about the planet and what exactly is going on with both its surface, 
underneath the surface, and of course its exosphere. But interestingly, even this recent passage discovered things that we never knew about Mercury already. For example, previous missions detected unusual plasma waves, very often referred to as chorus waves, that usually happen around planets with magnetospheres. And this was expected from a planet with a magnetosphere, but the detection of chorus waves also suggested maybe aurora. These plasma waves very often produce charged particles, which then interact with the atmosphere on planets like planet Earth. Mercury just doesn't have thick enough atmosphere. Its exosphere is extremely thin in comparison to even the Moon. Yet the Bepi Colombo mission found very intriguing evidence by measuring electrons as it was passing the planet. Here it saw an increase in electrons correlated with a sudden increase in a lot of X-ray emissions visible from the same location. Which basically implied that in this case, something is inducing a kind of an X-ray fluorescence, or essentially X-ray aurora, whenever the Sun becomes more active. And that by itself is a very strange discovery, because nobody expected Mercury to have these formations, and because it technically should be impossible. Yet it's clearly happening, and it's clearly causing a formation of aurora that we've never seen before. And this is actually something that happens on every planet in the solar system. Or so it seems. Basically this observation confirmed that aurora are a universal phenomenon. They do exist around all eight planets. But in most cases, maybe for different reasons. We know the aurora on Earth are produced through the interaction of the magnetosphere with the very powerful solar emissions. In this case, this basically causes charged particles to strike the atmosphere from very specific angles, and the charged particles interact with the atmosphere, producing the glow. This is very likely kind of what happens on Mercury as well. But instead of atmospheric interaction, it seems to be an interaction with the surface of Mercury, which results in the X-ray emissions instead of optical light, like on planet Earth. In comparison, on planets like Mars, for example, it actually produces ultraviolet emissions, which you can learn more about in the video in the description. On Venus, something similar happens to planet Earth with atmospheric aurora, but on various gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, because they're much farther away, the effects are much different. On Jupiter, for example, the aurora are permanent and are actually produced by Jupiter's very powerful magnetosphere interacting with the volcanic moon Io. Saturn, Uranus and Neptune have aurora as well, but in that case it seems to be the interaction with the Sun again. And so various types of aurora, visible in different types of light, seem to be a completely universal feature that most likely exists in other star systems as well. In this case, no atmosphere required at all and seems to be the result of the interaction with the surface. And so definitely quite a lot of really exciting discoveries and things we didn't know about coming from the surface of the planet we don't discuss much. But we're definitely going to be talking more about this once Bepi Colombo assumes a permanent orbit around the planet in 2026 and once it starts studying the planet by focusing directly on its surface and by using various instruments to measure the effects around the planet as well. And so by 2029, we're most likely going to know so much more about Mercury than we currently know now. And so until those future discoveries, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, thank you for watching, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.